Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be here and have your attention. Here we are, it's December, and we've reached our last Power of Story Presents event of the year. Thank you so much for tuning in. Mm -hmm. I couldn't think of two perfect people to bring together today who exemplify the meaning that there's nothing more powerful in the story to connect us. The topic, topic of our program is reaching readers, igniting community change. Mm -hmm. This work is a lot of hustle and creative thinking. The conversation begins with not what can we do for you, but what can we do together? From there, we're able to enact change and dream big. Our special guest, Malcolm Mitchell, unlocked a big dream by becoming a Super Bowl champion in 2017 for the New England Patriots. Among his numerous accomplishments on and off the field, he considers discovering a love of reading his greatest touchdown. He's also the founder initiative called Read with Malcolm and Share the Magic Foundation which introduces book ownership to students and works to improve literacy in underserved school. He is the author of the best-selling picture book, The Magician's Hat, and through his foundation, it has been distributed to more than 30,000 students in schools, children's hospitals, and community service organizations. Thank you, Malcolm. In his next picture book titled, My Favorite Book in the Whole Wide World. Yes, you guys say it just like that. It's available in just two weeks and we're so excited. You're going to fall in love with Henley, whose story is based on Malcolm's life as a reader. Through his advocacy in his books, Malcolm imparts an important message that every story has the potential to become a favorite. Malcolm, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a great introduction. I'll have to start uh, carrying you around with me, as I say. <laughs> Tell us how reading has reshaped your life and how it connects us to this new beautiful book. Yeah, let me take a few moments and start from a place that may not be as popular. Uh, growing up in Valdosta, Georgia, I was a striving reader, reluctant reader. The community that I was surrounded in promoted two ways to a more uh, affluent life, and that was sports and entertainment. I was no different than any other child in my community, so I did what felt most natural. I gravitated towards sports and neglected education and school. And that was a very, very poor mistake on my part. And I suffered the consequences as I got older. While sport has its uh, benefits, and I've had some phenomenal opportunities within sport, so I don't want to neglect that. Uh, I do want to say I love playing football. It was a huge part of my life. Um, but football alone would not set the standard for a sustainable life. Um, I realized that once I got to the University of Georgia. Challenges like grocery shopping, reading, sub, uh, subtitles on movies, just functioning as an everyday citizen, as an everyday person was hard because I was illiterate. I was an illiterate college student and I knew deep down that that was a problem. So I've always had this belief in being the best version of myself. So I figured if I wanted to uh, be the best Malcolm I could be, I needed to become a reader. And that journey was extremely challenging. Some words were too, so, some words were too long, some books too thick, some sentences too complex. And the overall process of reading was really, really tough. Um, but uh, through perseverance, yeah, I got over some of those reading phobias I grew comfortable with the ideal of being smart and uh, I became a reader. I surrounded myself by readers and I immersed myself in that community. And what ended up taking place is this unique transformation that you see today. Uh, this is me being here speaking to you the way using the language I'm using is an example of the magical powers of reading. In my very favorite book in the whole wide world, I take, uh, the readers on a very personal experience. Being illiterate was very lonely. It was very heartbreaking at times, but uh, that did not change the optimism um, and the very unique positive opportunities that came once I decided to find my very favorite book in the whole wide world. I love your story so much. Um, I feel like when you think of the words book joy, I always see your smiling face and hear your voice and your story. So thank you for that. Um, our other special guest uh, is Dr. Jacqueline Satterlin, who has served over 30 years in education. The pause there, 30 years. 
Thank you, Dr. Sadelin. <laughs> He's an accomplished school principal, professor, and dynamic speaker. Her trailblazing why not leadership has led to dramatic improvements in some of Southern California's most under-resourced schools. In her book, The Why Not Challenge, Say Yes to Success with Community School Partnerships, Dr. Jackie inspires readers on how to pave the way to mobilize their communities towards engagement in schools and hands-on suggestions to set obtainable goals. Dr. Jackie's innovative and visionary style has taken this simple question and turned into a movement for educators around the country. Welcome, Dr. Jackie. So Thank great you. to have you here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate you um, emphasizing 30 years. I, I don't think of it that way though. When I, when, you know, it's like, where did that time go? And it's just amazing how those 30 years um, really set the trajectory for my personal mission, um, which in the beginning, um, I will tell anyone, I did not even expect it to be. You know, I, I, I thought I was gonna be a newscaster. I was so very much into media and um, somehow um, I became uh, a teacher. And in that work um, turned into uh, 30 years of becoming uh, a curriculum specialist and an assistant principal and a principal. And I think that's exactly where I found my why not mission. I think back how my mother um, was really the, the, the place and point where I really discovered that why not mindset. Um, and it happened when I was one of two, my sister and I were the very first two African-American girls that were um, allowed in an all white school. And uh, my mother was so uh, focused on getting us in this school because it just had so many opportunities. It was clean, it was nice. It was, they had so many more books. The school that we went to was literally a book desert. We didn't have very much book in the books that we did have there were very old. And then getting into that school was really a feat at that time. It was before busing. Um, so you really just had to go to your home school. And um, segregation, to be honest, was, was still quite prevalent in a new way. And I remember when they did not want me, uh, you know, they just said, well, they had all kinds of reasons as to why we we couldn't go to that school. And I remember my mother saying to my dad, who was saying, listen, I, I don't think we're going to be able to get them in there. And she said, why not? And I remember that. When I began to write this book, I, I'm so glad I reflected and really remembered that, you know, and then I remember her taking a lot of delicious food to the principal and, and, and then that's what did it, you know, some things just make things happen and food did it. And next thing you know, we were, you know, in that school and we made great friends and it was really um, the foundation um, kind of really connecting to Malcolm's story a bit. When I got a hold of those books, they had a library that I had never seen before. It, it changed, I was, it just changed my whole focus. And I remember when I became a principal and I wondered um, how my scholars, and I call them scholars uh, because I always believe that um, they're not just students, that we should speak into their life and they will rise to that occasion. So I, I call them all scholars. And I, and I said, I'm going to do that here. We were in a school district that was very, you know, it was difficult, it was hard, didn't have a lot of funding. And um, I remember one of the very first partnerships that I got, um, we developed a brand new library on my campus. Tore down walls, created a big, huge library. All of our scholars were part of planning it, painting it, putting murals. And, it, you know, and I remember sitting on the corner with the sign that said, please give us books for our library. I remember that. Um, all day long. And I, I remember I had to change and say, I'm a principal because people thought I was a bum. I was out there for a long time, you know, and I had to say, listen, I'm out here with a purpose. We need books for a library. And I remember that's exactly what happened. And it changed um, people's hearts. And it, I think it even brought empathy in a way where not sympathy, but empathy, where they wanted to be part of something greater. And, and just like Malcolm said, you know, just that joy I saw that joy in my scholars when they had tons of books that we never had before in a brand new library that I we could have never afforded. 
by ourselves, which which really I think also led to me um, down the road of developing community partnerships and seeing that their role in this work. It's an amazing story. Um, as you mentioned, Dr. J, both you and Malcolm have some com some things in common. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm going to sit back now, and I want you guys to conversate and share what those those goals are. Um, so, go ahead. I have a, a immediate question that came about as you were speaking. Okay. So, if you don't mind, I'd like to start by asking you the first tough question. All right. Uh, the beautiful uh, thing about culture. I think African American culture, seeing we're both African Americans, is there's this uh, really. I've been one for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Fifty-one there, years. <laughs> there's this um, historical hardship. Yeah. That I think produces this beautiful resiliency that your mother obviously possessed, trying to get you into a school where uh, it was said you were not allowed. I think in my community that I grew up in, hardship would be trying to get off government assistance. Um, but I want to take that idea of resilience and put it in terms of, of reading, because in, the reality is there are millions of kids around the world that uh, not only don't have the ability to read, but once they start, it is an extremely hard process. I remember trying to read books and could not understand the words. That's a very lonely feeling uh, and it's very easy to give up. So from your experience as an educator, what advice would you give those kids just to continue their resiliency and, and getting this great skill? Well, that's a great question because you're certainly not alone. I, I've seen that um, happen um, and uh, it, it, you can see on the children's face when they are struggling and struggling to decode a word, struggling to even, a lot of people say getting them to comprehend, but if you can't even decode a word, um, you know, there you are um, really kind of faking it until you make it and, and sometimes right. you don't make it. Um, one of the things that I always say, um, and I say it to educators, I remind myself and I say it to scholars, and it reminds me of when I was a kid doing the same thing. First of all, um, have fun with your books. You know, one of the things my, my mother used to do, and I, taking me to the library, she she never said go to the books that you're supposed to go to. Mm -hmm. Get any book you want. I love your mom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know what? I felt free to go to the library. My mom was like, go to get any book you want. We have to think, I, I think we have to really stop trying to um, compartmentalize reading if that makes sense. What role do you think community plays in that? Well, that's a great question. I think the community plays a great role in that because just like the libraries can be partners to bringing opportunities for students, um, so can um, other businesses and um, corporates, executives and local businesses and mom and pop shops. You know, reading is everywhere. Right. First of all, reading is everywhere. Reading is not just at school. Reading is not just in books. Reading is also when your children, if they go to church on Sunday, they can allow them to read the uh, uh, the, uh, the announcements. Or when you go to the store, you know, you can have them to read everything that you see, you know, all of the labels and just driving, you know, counting out, speak, looking at all of the reading on the billboards. One of the things I used to do with uh, I'll, I'll name McDonald's. I remember I was like, I, I, we had a local McDonald's down the street. And I said, listen, I would love to post my students writing um, in your restaurant. And they were like, well, we never thought about doing that. I remember having a meeting and next thing you know, they devoted a whole wall to putting up students writing and poems. So think about all of the kids that were coming in there and families pointing to their child's writing right. and the children feeling very, very happy. But see, the reason why that was such an important piece for that community partner uh, to do that was it elevated literacy to a place beyond what our school did. It was great for them. And next thing you know, it also impacted others who were just coming in there. That's just one example of how community partners can really play a part of highlighting and uh, really um, 
recognizing literacy is an important piece. One of the one of the toughest um, one of the toughest things for me to understand as a, as a kid, as I reflect, um, is I, I had a really hard time understanding why reading or being literate was beneficial mm. for my long term success. Uh, culturally, there are so many other things taking place in that environment that reading just seemed like a hindrance. Right. Right. I couldn't understand the value of getting a, an A in class. I can understand the value of getting a B in class. I, I just was not able to connect the dots and really understand why this was so important. Because when I go to the football field and I catch a pass, that's way more glorified than when I get an A. Hmm. So wow. for me, I was as I went along that process, I was almost trained to appreciate what was glorified versus uh, what may be in actuality most beneficial. And to your point, if you glorify reading, maybe more kids will read. <laughs> um, well, it, absolutely. And, and, it, and what you said earlier, it does create resilience. Yeah. You see, because that's, that's what the power of story really is. Right. The power of story is also the ability to tell your story. Right. And the more opportunities we allow student voice and elevate um, common language and elevate ideas. Um, and you can do this through liter literacy circles. You can just do it through debate. Um, it really does kind of do what, what happened on the, on, on the field for you. It is a touchdown, right? right? It's a touchdown for everyone who was a part. Right. Of that. I want to share this really cool experience with you. Um, okay. it, it makes me smile because it's one of the most, uh, I'm already smiling. It, 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 <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty cool in, in terms of how it kind of shifted my perspective. Mm -hmm. So I was in college, I was a sophomore and I had came off this freshman, all sec, uh, performance. So I was doing pretty well on the field. I was still struggling substantially, um, in the classroom. And once you get into college, you quickly understand you're, you're not a baby anymore. Um, so I'm in college and I'm having these issues at the grocery store that I mentioned. I'm having these issues reading subtitles and I get on YouTube one night and I look up one of my favorite music artists. And at the time that person was Jay-Z and I'm watching all of his rap videos. Of course, he's talking about cars and jewelry and uh, I'm infatuated with that, uh, sh I shamelessly, shamelessly admit. But then after you watch so many videos on YouTube, you right. know, the fee kind of shifts hmm. to keep you locked in. Mm -hmm. So as I'm going on this YouTube journey of Jay-Z uh, videos, a video of him pops up with another person um, who they said was one of the wealthiest men in the world. And I was curious. So I clicked on the video and when the interview started, Jay-Z's vernacular shifted so drastically, it made me pause and rethink what was taking place because I had only heard him through music, not through um, traditional communication. Mm -hmm. In this interview, he starts talking about literacy. He starts talking about books. He starts talking about the book he wrote. And he's feeding back with this other individual as they go on this long journey of how reading is important, right? This is the same guy who told me cars and clothes were important. Now he's saying reading is important. Wow. And that moment was um, a defining moment in my life because at that point I realized that um, what's most important is not always what people want to sell you. Mm. Sometimes you have to take a step back and say, what's most beneficial to me? Uh, and when uh, he, was he was sitting down talking to Warren Buffett, and when Warren Buffett mentioned he's also a reader and reading is what made him successful, I began to realize, okay, there's a correlation between reading and success, and maybe I should really give it a try. It's only a cool experience because I think that has shaped part of my story and trying to get kids in low income communities to realize, hey, I, I know what you see on TV, but let me give you a bit of what's real. And what's real is if you cannot read, you cannot be productive in society. 
And you know what? Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing that because first of all, reading is in my view, um, and it's one of the things that I know and believe is that reading is absolutely the way up. It is a trajectory that cannot be reached without those skills of reading and not just being able to read, but being able to understand, being able to explore, being able to enjoy that reading. I'm a professional athlete and I've, and I've um, been an avid reader. I have, got, I have gained more opportunities in my life through being a reader versus being a professional athlete. That's the 100% truth. I didn't want to cut you off, but I thought that was a great point to interject that fact. Well, listen, let's, uh, let's share a bit more about your book. I think uh, your, your story is incredible. Uh, I, I love everything about uh, why not and saying yes to the challenge. As a competitor, that's obviously uh, at the core of, of my belief. Uh, maybe share a little bit of uh, what you'd like your readers to get from the book. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, when writing the book as an educator, I speak about mainly um, really how schools can benefit from connecting. So the, 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 the heart of the book is about connection and the power of connection. This work that we do in education, while it's great, it is very difficult and complex. And we cannot do it alone well. Um, we've seen this time after time again, where you know uh, every year you know schools have a new initiative, a new plan, a new vision. And one of the things that I have experienced myself is the power of partnerships and how they've come in. I've been able to um, work with them, share with them our vision, and realize that they're looking for us too, because they're in the communities of our schools. And if we ever could come together and work together and align forces, um, we could do so much better um, and more good than we can individually. I believe we worked in silos far too long. And now to be able to bring um, more educational equity, um, restorative practices, um, and even support for our families. Being a principal in um, under-resourced communities for all of my career, um, I learned this. I learned that I didn't have to do this work alone. I learned and I began to put this why not challenge on myself. When I was out um, on the playground, um, and as I, as I do, as I used to do every, every morning to kind of corral the kids, get them excited and, and say, you know, you're scholars, repeat after me, I'm a scholar. And they would repeat after me almost anything I would tell them. And, <laughs> and one of the things I used to say, you know, is, you know, what, what do you want? And, you know, that, that, that question alone was like, it would take like, oh my gosh, they love that question. What do you want? So they would start saying, oh, I want a new playground. I knew I want a new basketball court or I want, they just started, I mean, they started saying stuff that I was like, okay, well, I don't know if we can do all that. <laughs> <laughs> they started, I mean, you know, I was opening up a huge can of worms right. and, and then I thought, why not? And I remember them chanting that and it became a mantra, Malcolm. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, it wasn't, what'd you say? It's such a great phrase. Why not? I know. But then they started using it. Like I would see them on the way down the hall. They would say, hey, Dr. Sanford, why not? And it was like, they, were, they, were, they started holding me accountable to our morning assemblies of what we said. I mean, you know, this, this beat talking about rules and, you know, make sure you wash your hands and all that kind of stuff. They were like, why, why not? Do think, why do you think that phrase is so powerful? You know, thank you. I think that phrase is so powerful because it's it opens up possibility. Yeah. It's it's possibility that seconds before wasn't there. It it allowed us to dream bigger. Right. Whether we believed it was going to happen or not. It was, it was a great inspiration and springboard to possibility. And it was exciting to talk about the why not. And it also developed, I think, a why not mindset. So before we had such a fixed mindset, you know, as Carol Dweck talks about. Right. And 
but talking about why not opens up a growth mindset that we hadn't had before. I think and really it, it was contagious, really. Let me tell you why I love I love that phrase and I love the way you write about it in your book. It's it's self-explanatory. <laughs> yeah, that's true. In mid-conversation, if we're saying, you know, I want to be a pilot. Uh, and the phrase why not comes about after that. What's well, kind of, it's almost empowering because at that point, um, it's not, I don't have to explain myself. I right. don't have to have this massive amount of confidence. All I know is I've now convinced myself to take the next, next step by saying, why not? It's really cool. Well, listen, I, I don't know if you have some more questions for me because I do have some questions for you. Sure, let's let's do them. First of all, I gotta wear glasses, you know. That's one of the things that happens when you when you get a little older. Keep keep living. One of the things, first of all, you know, your story, everybody has such a story. And I just wanna first of all publicly thank you um, for being so transparent and open and authentic. Um, because uh, and also courageous. Uh, to be able to share what you're what you're saying because uh, most people may not share that or admit to those things and you're also I believe carrying so many other stories and you've taken your energy and you're pouring it into books that are going to just impact lives you know reading your books just was so heartwarming you know, read with Malcolm and now this new book coming out. Oh my gosh, you are just going to sweep everybody away. But I think you're going to also give them the courage to read and embrace the joy of reading. And so as an educator, I just, I just thank you for that. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say thank you. So I, I have a few questions that really kind of um, made me think. What do you hope readers um, are going to take away from your story? Well, in my very favorite book in the whole wide world, um, you will see, even with the first book I wrote, The Magician's Hat, it, it starts off with this, um, this very real hardship. Mm -hmm. And uh, because being illiterate, it's not a great thing. Um, it's, it's, a really lonely place to be. It's uh, it's heartbreaking at times, feeling like you're isolated on this island of illiteracy. <laughs> uh, uh, but through uh, perseverance, through courage, through community, through uh, mentors, you you slowly begin to understand and appreciate what reading can do for you to the point at which you want to try it. And that's a very real experience for me. It's only when I realized that this was an extraordinary gift at my disposal that I wanted to take advantage of it. Uh, and I'm really trying to get the readers in uh, every book that I write, and especially in my very favorite book in the whole wide world, to give reading a try. Mm -hmm. No one is a natural born reader. That's not true. Everyone, it's a learned skill. It's acquired over over time. Um, and there is a book. There are billions of books. There's one for you. Now, it may take you a while to track it down. And it may be something you have to create for yourself. But there is a book out there that I think can electrify the reader inside of everyone. Wow. What, what do you hope educators take away from your book? Because you're gonna, your book is going to be in the hands of, of teachers and principals and, and you know, it's going to be in classroom libraries. It's interesting because I was reading this article or um, someone shared an article with me about, I'm going to come back full circle, about kids. Uh, and I'm a new father. So they say kids really, you really shouldn't disregard anything a child seems not to like. You should just try it in a new way. Right. Example, if your child doesn't like steamed broccoli, maybe bake it. If you don't like baked broccoli, maybe fry it. I don't know the many different ways you can cook broccoli. And I think that's what I would, would like educators to take that same approach with reading. Maybe the book about trains doesn't work. Maybe the book about um, uh, birds doesn't work. Maybe the book about football doesn't work. Uh, 
maybe it's not a book that works at all. Maybe it's a magazine. Maybe it's audio book. Just keep trying stuff until one sticks because one will. Yeah. Wow. I love that. Yeah. That is such, I mean, I got hungry at the same time. <laughs> all of that was such a great example. <laughs> and you know what? There is a book, right? For yeah. everybody. And that book speaks to you. Um, what would you say um, was important? Why was it important rather for you to write these books in addition to those that you write, wrote in the Literacy Foundation? Why was, was it important for you? Yeah, I was 19 years old when I began to understand I needed to be literate. Um, now, let's just work off of some statistics. Uh, there are statistics that establish if you don't have an understanding of literacy by fourth grade, you're more likely to be incarcerated, you're more likely to drop out of school, you're more likely to be on government assistance, and you're more likely to be on of poor health. These are all tied to a literacy rate in an individual. Um, now you take those statistics and then you apply it to the reality I had as a child. We, ha we didn't have age appropriate books at home. We are in a very impoverished community. I was in a single parent household and we made less than th $35,000 annually. Now you take those statistics with my reality and you say this should not be happening. <laughs> Um, statistically, uh, but I had this God gift ability that made me an outlier, and that was uh, athleticism. So football helped mend some of those uh, fractures from a childhood that uh, I did not pick, and my mother did not pick either. It was just the reality of the situation, uh, and it's no one's fault. I want to be clear in saying that when I make that comparison, I'm not blaming anybody. Right. Uh, uh, but that does not change it being the reality. Uh, right. And I had football to pull me out of that, out of those uh, tough uh, scenarios. As I got to the University of Georgia, well, at that point, I was given the ability to look back, mm -hmm. see uh, my community for exactly what it was. Right. And I was able to look at my friends and see the trajectory of their life. And I said, man, I think we could have all avoided some of this, uh, some of these poor decisions if we were all readers, <laughs> right? But no one told us to read. No one cool was telling us to read. No one we perceived to be cool was telling us to read. Um, so I said, well, if I have a platform where people want to listen to what I have to say, well, this is my opportunity to give them something that I think will change their life and allow them to avoid some of those poor decisions that people make in certain environments. And to me, that, that was reading. If I wanted to encourage people to read, maybe I should write. You know, Malcolm, um, someone like you, I, I don't consider a role model. I consider you a real model. Oh, thank you. And because role models sometimes uh, don't tell the truth, uh, they're hard to get to, and they're very far away. But being a real model as yourself, who's been able to reveal the good and the bad, right now, as a child who is looking at you right now, who is uh, a aspiring football player or basketball player or athlete, um, but is in school and struggling and trying to really get their mind wrapped around um, what they need to do academically. Uh, what would you say to them as they're looking at you right now as what they can do um, to achieve what you have achieved or more? How, what can you say to them? What tips can you give them? What takeaway right now from your life would you share? I would set the playing field by saying, I have been in a single parent household. I have experienced being suspended from school. I have experienced being an ISS. I have experienced failure. I have experienced um, not being able to get the sneakers you want. I've experienced hand-me-downs. I've experienced wearing the same clothes back to back to school. 
Um, I've also experienced a college degree. I've also experienced a uh, decent paycheck. I've also experienced a Super Bowl. I've experienced traveling to other countries. I've experienced uh, numerous things. And what I'm trying to say is I have seen a decent amount and I have done a decent amount. And there's nothing more beneficial that I have done than deciding to become an avid reader. So if I'm encouraging you, uh, it would be to persist and prevail through that initial uh, misunderstanding of literacy. And I would ask you to just keep trying because one day when you turn around, you will realize the benefits of being a reader and it will change your life forever. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you for your story. I'm just gonna take a deep breath. Ah, <laughs> oh, well, I was right, right? Two better people to bring together today for this conversation. I keep, I've been glancing at uh, your photos, at these two book covers. Look, yeah. look perfect. Look how perfect they are. Beautiful together. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> You're supposed to be. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing so many memories and emotions that you're, both of you have shared in my own childhood and how reading has been a touchstone to me and now my kids. As I was thinking about when you said, you know, your journey. And for me, instantly took it back to my bedroom reading The Babysitter's Club or Speed Valley High and knowing those books were my salvation for what right. was happening around me. Um, so anyway, I just want to, I just think that's so beautiful. Like, other you share and how that also enacts memories and opens up doors. And so just grateful, so grateful for the two of you. Thank you so much. Before we end our program, I wanted to propose one last question to both of you. Um, through your amazing you know, work through creating books for readers, your partnerships, your, your, your amazing ways that you enact community change, right? Um, how can me, how can youth, how can grandparents, caregivers, what are some three easy ways or practical ways that I can, after ending this, ending this, watching this video, what can I do? What is one thing I can do or three things? Yeah, please. Okay. Well, first of all, when you just mentioned all those people, I just want to remind that is community. So community, uh, when I ever mention that in the book about community partners, it's not always people on the outside, it's those on the inside, it's your, the family, it's the people down the street, it's the mom and pop store, it's everybody is part of this community. And one of the things that I think you can certainly do is recognize your community. And the community needs to be able to pour into that child or children that are around them. Um, share their stories, just like Malcolm has shared his story and it was very impactful. A lot of our young people need to hear your story. They need to hear how reading was important to you. They need to know what it, how it impacted you. And it, you would grow into in their eyes um, once you share that story. Um, and I would also mention to uh, go to the library and say, read whatever you want. <laughs> you know, just let them rip. Let them just go. Go at it. And really um, reach out to your faith-based organizations, reach out to those stores, reach out to those, to your community and say, let's work together on how we can glorify reading. Can you help me? What ideas do you have? Don't have those ideas in mind. Let the community speak to you. Sometimes they've been waiting for you and they're like, wow, thank you. I have an idea about this. And then you're open to that and you will be surprised how uh, you all can innovatively come up with different ways um, to really push reading to the forefront and literacy, making it um, not just accessible, but also attainable. So um, those are just my two cents on that. Malcolm? I have two really. One would be to, uh, uh, when, my very, very, when my very favorite book in the whole wide world is uh, available, read it, uh, not because I want you to, to buy a book. I just think the story is helpful in understanding some realities for a lot of kids. And it's, it was my reality. And I, I, I tried my best to put my reality in that book. Hopefully 
not only to motivate kids, but to help adults understand. Mm. Secondly, I would say I, I created Share the Magic Foundation, which is my youth literacy foundation that focuses on book ownership in low income communities and promoting the long term benefits of being an active reader. Uh, go to my website, www.readwithmalcolm.com. Look around, check it out. Uh, if you like it, please reach out. I'd love to find a way to enter your community and be a part of your process in growing and fostering a love for reading. And I'd like to also add as well um, to educators who are watching who would like to know how do I connect these business partners? How do I reach out to them? How can they help me in my school or my classroom? Um, please go to the whynotincubator.com where I am providing a lot of training and workshops that will really help you to um, elevate equity in your schools through the use of community partnerships, how you can build those bridges um, to help all of your scholars cross over. Um, there is simple ways that you can do that. Um, I'm excited to talk with you um, and go deeper and take a deeper dive into your, your, not just your needs, but what do you want? And, mm -hmm. and guess what? There's somebody out there who wants to make your dreams come true. So I look forward to speaking with you as well. Thank you both. This was truly a dream come true for me. Follow Malcolm and Dr. J on social media. They're available, buy their books. Um, they're available wherever books are sold. Um, everyone take care. Thank you for being here. Take care of each other. Be safe, be healthy. And thank you for being for the Power Story event series. Bye-bye. Everybody, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>